Hello, my name is Rosalind Campbell, and I'm a bioarchaeologist specializing in ancient Egypt. Welcome to Peopling the Past. What topic am I talking about today? Today, I'm going to be talking about paleo-oncology, or the study of cancer in the past. Now, there's sometimes the misconception that cancer did not exist in the past, and this idea has been perpetuated by studies that seem to suggest that most cancers are due to human-made pollutants in the modern world. And while it is true that there are aspects of our modern world that certainly contribute to cancer, such as smoking tobacco or being exposed to certain types of pollutants or radiation, it is not true that cancer did not exist in antiquity. In fact, just in the last few years, scientists have even identified cancer in fossilized dinosaur bones. So clearly there are other causes of cancer than just human-made pollutants. But we also still don't entirely understand the different causes of different forms of cancer. We do now know that cancer isn't just one disease, but has many forms. And we know that a lot of different factors, including pollutants, but also random mutations and increased lifespan, contribute to the occurrence of cancer. My colleagues and co-founders of the Paleo Oncology Research Organization have been working together to understand and identify cancers in the past and to provide tools for other researchers who might find cancer in ancient human remains. Now for this kind of research, it's absolutely vital that we work collaboratively with others who have different knowledge, experience, and specializations. The field of paleo-oncology is relatively new. And right now, most of our knowledge comes from just the past century and a half or so, when the medical field started being able to identify and treat different types of cancers. But what if we could expand our data set to include evidence from many thousands of years? We could learn so much more about how cancer has evolved and changed and maybe get better ideas of how to treat and even prevent different types of cancers in the future. What sources or data do I look at? Now, in modern times, cancer is usually identified by symptoms. If you haven't been feeling well or have a strange growth, you go to the doctor and they may do a series of blood tests and CT or other scans in order to see if they can find a cancer lesion. But of course, this wasn't really possible in the ancient world. Now, there are several different ways to approach the study of cancer in antiquity. I am a bioarchaeologist, which means I study ancient human remains. Usually, I work with skeletons, and it's sometimes possible to identify cancer in skeletal remains. Some types of cancer originate in bone, but others may spread or metastasize to the skeleton from the original tumor. By comparing notes with modern clinical studies, we can get a good idea of how cancer spreads and what parts of the body are usually affected in certain types of cancer. And this can help us identify cancerous lesions on ancient human remains. This is an example that was found over a century ago at the site of Nagader in Southern Egypt. This woman who died around the age of 45 years seems to have suffered from a malignant tumor that destroyed the bone around her nose and face. This image shows a femur or the upper thigh bone from a young man who lived in what is around 1200 BCE in what is now Sudan. The scholars who studied this individual were able to use x-rays as you can see in the image on the right, as well as other technology like CT scans to determine that this young man suffered from some kind of soft tissue cancer that had spread or metastasized to the bone. Now, in this case, it's important to be able to distinguish between lesions from cancer, which are pointed out by the white arrows in these images, from damage to the bone that has occurred due to the burial environment or the soil content. As more scholars publish these kinds of studies, 
we can get a better idea of what cancers might look like in ancient human remains. But of course, looking at skeletons only gives us part of the picture. Cancers that occur in the soft tissue, like melanoma, might not spread to the bone and thus can become invisible in archeological contexts. Even if it's possible to extract DNA from ancient remains in the hope of looking at soft tissue cancers, we aren't always able to get enough data for a secure diagnosis. We also can't really get a good idea of how ancient people thought about cancers and tried to treat them from skeletons alone. In order to get this kind of information, we turn to text. Many ancient cultures, such as the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Romans, have left us medical texts that describe treatments for a wide variety of conditions. Although these texts are not always clear, and it's not always possible to link descriptions of symptoms and treatment to modern diseases, in some cases, we are able to find descriptions that seem to describe various types of cancer. In ancient Egyptian language, for example, there are a few words that seem to describe different types of tumors. The first word at the top here, written in hieroglyphs, was probably pronounced something like a'at, and seems to describe a growth or a tumor that primarily aff afflicted young people, such as perhaps Ewing sarcoma or neuroblastomas. Other words are more vague, like shefut, the word in the middle, which means something like a swelling, but it could be a tumor, or wehedu, which is even more vague and means something that causes a disease, usually something like an evil spirit or a, a demon of some kind. Several Egyptian texts also describe an ill breast, which may be a reference to malignant breast cancer. But of course, Egypt wasn't the only culture that recorded conditions that seemed to be cases of ancient cancer. In fact, our word cancer is described from the Greek word karkinos, which means crab, and was first used by the Greek physician Hippocrates around 400 BCE to refer to the spreading crab-like appearance of certain tumors. He was also the first person we know of who believed that cancer was not caused by supernatural forces like evil influences or demons. Less than a century later, the Greek historian Herodotus wrote about the queen Atassa, wife to the Persian king Darius, and described what sounds like an inflammatory breast tumor. Prescribed treatments for cancers varied a great deal. Of course, before the invention of chemotherapy and radiation, most treatments were topical. So they probably weren't very effective at treating the cancer itself, although they might have helped treat symptoms of pain and discomfort. A Roman named Cato the Elder, who lived during the second century BCE, prescribed a cabbage poultice for tumors. The physician Dioscorides, who lived about 200 years later, used a variety of treatments, ranging from a compound made of beetles to poultices of flowers like crocuses and included sometimes a specific type of cucumber. Sometimes physicians did try to surgically remove tumors that they could see, but of course in ancient times without sterilization and without the ability to see how many cancer cells had spread beyond the original tumor before surgery was attempted, these surgeries were not very effective and often caused death by infection. How can this topic or material tell us about real people in the past? By looking farther into the past for different types of cancer, we are able to get a better idea of who was affected by these diseases. For example, several years ago, my colleague and co-founder of PRO, Catherine Hunt, surveyed published cases of different types of cancer from ancient Egypt and found that men, women, and children of all ages were affected by different types of cancer over the course of thousands of years. And this, of course, is just the cases that we identified and which were published when the study was conducted. We can probably assume that many more cases were simply not diagnosed by modern researchers because the field of paleo-oncology is so new. As we broaden our gaze, scholars have found evidence of cancer in ancient human remains all around the world. 
as we learn more about different types of cancer, we can also go back to human remains in museums who may have been overlooked when diagnostic criteria and methods were less developed than they are now. By incorporating studies of both human remains as well as ancient texts, we can get a better idea of how cancers might have appeared in the past and if they reacted to any of the treatments applied by ancient physicians. For example, one of the treatments mentioned by Dioscorides contained cucumber parts and enzymes from this cucumber are still used in certain cancer treatments today. We can also learn more about the factors that influence whether or not someone will get cancer, like environmental or other health conditions, or genetic factors, or certain types of pollutants. This could help us treat and prevent cancers in the future. The reality though, is that even if you did everything right, you ate healthy, you exercised, you didn't expose yourself to any pollutants that you know of, you could still get cancer. Random cell mutations increase with age. And as we live longer and get better at diagnosing cancer earlier, it is natural that the occurrence of cancer will probably increase, but we'll also find more cases of cancer simply because we're getting better at knowing what to look for. And I say this not to be discouraging or to scare people, but instead to emphasize how important it is to acknowledge how much we still don't know about cancer. It's vital that we not perpetuate the culture of shame that sometimes accompanies people who get cancer, who feel that they should have done something differently, lived a different lifestyle, so that cancer wouldn't have attacked their body. There are so many factors that can contribute to different types of cancer. And if we are able to study thousands of years of how cancer has manifested and evolved, we can get a better idea of how to treat and even prevent it in the future. Thank you so much for listening. And for more information, please visit peoplingthepast.com. <laughs>